Servius Tullius was the legendary sixth king of Rome, and the second of its Etruscan dynasty. He reigned 575-535 BC. Roman and Greek sources describe his servile origins and later marriage to a daughter of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, Rome's first Etruscan king, who was assassinated in 579 BC. Servius was variously said to have been the first Roman king to accede without election by the Senate, having gained the throne by popular support at the contrivance of his mother-in-law, and the first to be elected by the Senate without reference to the people. Several traditions describe Servius a father as divine. Livy depicts Servius a mother as a captured Latin princess enslaved by the Romans. Her child is chosen as Rome's future king after a ring of fire is seen around his head. The Emperor Claudius discounted such origins and described him as an originally Etruscan mercenary, named Mastana, who fought for Celius by Bena. Servius was a popular king, and one of Rome's most significant benefactors. He had military successes against Veri and the Etruscans, and expanded the city to include the Quirinal, Viminal and Escaline hills. He is credited with the institution of the Compitalia festivals, the building of temples to Fortuna and Diana, and the invention of Rome's first true coinage. Despite the opposition of Rome's patricians, he expanded the Roman franchise and improved the lot and fortune of Rome's lowest classes of citizens and non-citizens. According to Livy, he reigned for 44 years, until murdered by his daughter Tullia and son-in-law Tarquinius Superbus. In consequence of this tragic crime, and his hubristic arrogance as king, Tarquinius was eventually removed. This cleared the way for the abolition of Rome's monarchy and the founding of the Roman Republic, whose groundwork had already been laid by Servius' reforms. Background before its establishment as a republic, Rome was ruled by kings. In Roman tradition, Rome's founder Romulus was the first, Servius Tullius was the sixth, and his successor Tarquinius Superbus was the last. The nature of Roman kingship is unclear. Most Roman kings were elected by the Senate, as to a lifetime magistracy, but some claimed succession through dynastic or divine right. Some were native Romans, others were foreign. Later Romans had a complex ideological relationship with this distant past. In republican mores and institutions kingship was abhorrent, and remained so, in name at least, during the empire. On the one hand, Romulus was held to have brought Rome into being more or less at a stroke. So complete and purely Roman in its essentials that any acceptable change or reform thereafter must be clothed as restoration. On the other, Romans of the Republican Empire saw each king as contributing in some distinctive and novel way to a city's fabric and territories, or its social, military, religious, legal or political institutions. Servius Tullius has been described as Rome's second founder, the most complex and enigmatic of all its kings, and a kind of proto-republican magistrate. Ancient source is the oldest surviving source for the overall political developments of the Roman kingdom and republic is Cicero's De Republica, written in 44 BC. The main literary sources for Servius' life and achievements are the Roman historian Livy whose Aburb Condita was generally accepted by the Romans as the standard, most authoritative account, Livy's near-contemporary Dionysius of Halicarnassus, and Plutarch. Their own sources included works by Quintus Fabius Picta, Diocles of Pepperthus, Quintus Ennius and Cato the Elder. Livy's sources probably included at least some official state records. He excluded what seemed implausible or contradictory traditions and arranged his material within an overarching chronology. Dionysius and Plutarch offer various alternatives not found in Livy, and Livy's own pupil, the Etruscologist, historian and emperor Claudius, offered yet another, based on Etruscan tradition, Servius' origins, parentage and birth. Most Roman sources name Servius a mother as Ocrisia, a young noblewoman taken at the Roman siege of Corniculum and brought to Rome, either pregnant by her husband, who was killed at the siege, or as a virgin. 
She was given to Tanakil, wife of King Tarquinius, and though slave was treated with the respect due her former status. In one variant, she became wife to a noble client of Tarquinius. In others, she served the domestic rights of the royal hearth as a vestal virgin, and on one such occasion, having damped the hearth flames with a sacrificial offering, she was penetrated by a disembodied phallus that rose from the hearth. According to Tanakil, this was a divine manifestation, either of the household La or Vulcan himself. Thus Servius was divinely fathered and already destined for greatness, despite his mother's servile status for the time being. Tanakil and Ocrisia kept this a secret. Early life Servius' birth to a slave of the royal household made him part of Tarkin's extended familia. Ancient sources infer him as protege, rather than adopted son, as he married Tarquinius and Tanakil's daughter, named by some sources as Gegania. All sources agree that before his accession, either in his early childhood or later, members of the royal household witnessed a nimbus of fire about his head while he slept, a sign of divine favor and a great portent. He proved a loyal, responsible son-in-law. When given governmental and military responsibilities, he excelled in both. Reign. In Livy's account, Tarquinius Priscus had been elected king on the death of the previous king, Ancus Marcius, whose two sons were too young to inherit or offer themselves for election. When Servius' a popularity and marriage to Tarquinius made him a likely successor to the kingship, these sons attempted to seize the throne for themselves. They hired two assassins, who attacked and severely wounded Tarquinius. Tarnakil immediately ordered the palace to be shut, and publicly announced from a palace window that Tarquinius had appointed Servius as regent. Meanwhile, Tarquinius died of his wounds. When his death became public knowledge, the Senate elected Servius as king, and the sons of Ancus fled to exile in Suisapomitia. Livy describes this as the first occasion that the people of Rome were not involved in the election of the king. In Plutarch, Servius reluctantly consented to the kingship at the deathbed insistence of Tanakil. Early in his reign, Servius warred against Veri and the Etruscans. He is said to have shown valor in the campaign, and to have routed a great army of the enemy. His success helped him to cement his position at Rome. According to the Faster Triumphanials, Servius celebrated three triumphs over the Etruscans, including on 25 November 571 BC and 25 May 567 BC. In Livy's history, Servius Tullius had two daughters, Tullia the Younger and Tullia the Elder. He arranged their marriage to the two sons of his predecessor, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. The younger Tullia married Aruns Tarquinius. The elder Tullia married Lucius Tarquinius. But Tullia the younger and Lucius Tarquinius shared a fierce and ambitious temperament, and were drawn together in conspiracy. They procured the murders of their respective siblings, married, and conspired to remove Servius Tullius. Tullia encouraged Lucius Tarquinius to secretly persuade or bribe senators, and Tarquinius went to the Senate House with a group of armed men. Then he summoned the senators and gave a speech criticizing Servius for being a slave born of a slave, for failing to be elected by the Senate and the people during an interregnum, as had been the tradition for the election of kings of Rome, for being gifted the throne by a woman, for favoring the lower classes of Rome over the wealthy and for taking the land of the upper classes for distribution to the poor, and for instituting the census so that the wealth of the upper classes might be exposed to popular envy. When Servius Tullius arrived at the Senate House to defend his position, Tarquinius threw him down the steps and Servius was murdered in the street by Tarquin's men. Soon after, Tullia drove her chariot over her father's body. For Livy, Tarquinius' or impious refusal to permit his father-in-law's burial and him the sobriquet, Superbus and Servius' a death is of tragic crime, a dark episode in Rome's history and just cause for the abolition of the monarchy. 
Servius thus becomes the last of Rome's benevolent kings, the place of this outrage, which Livy seems to suggest as a crossroads, is known thereafter as Vicus Celeratus. His murder is parricide, the worst of all crimes. This morally justifies Tarquin's eventual expulsion and the abolition of Rome's aberrant, un-Roman, monarchy. Livy's Republic is partly founded on the achievements and death of Rome's last benevolent king, Servian reforms. Most of the reforms credited to Servius extended voting rights to certain groups, in particular to Rome's citizen commoners. Minor landholders hitherto disqualified from voting by ancestry, status or ethnicity. The same reforms simultaneously defined the fiscal and military obligations of all Roman citizens. As a whole, the so-called Servian reforms probably represent a long-drawn, complex and piecemeal process of populist policy and reform, extending from Servius the predecessors, Ancus Marcius and Tarquinius Priscus, to his successor Tarquinius Superbus, and into the Middle and Late Republic. Rome's military and territorial expansion and consequent changes in its population would have made franchise regulation and reform an ongoing necessity, and their wholesale attribution to Servius cannot be taken at face value. Curate reform and census until the Servian reforms, the passing of laws and judgment was the prerogative of the Comitia Curiata, made up from 30 curi. Roman sources describe 10 curi for each of three aristocratic tribes or clans, each supposedly based on one of Rome's central hills, and claiming patrician status by virtue of their descent from Rome's founding families. These tribes comprised approximately 200 gents, each of which contributed one senator to the Senate. The Senate advised the king, devised laws in his name, and was held to represent the entire populace Romanus, but it could only debate and discuss. Its decisions had no force unless approved by the Comitia Curiata. By the time of Servius, if not long before, the tribes of the Comitia were a minority of the population, ruling a multitude with no effective voice in their own government. Rome's far more populous citizen commoners could participate in this assembly in limited fashion, and perhaps offer their opinions on decisions but only the Comitia Curiata could vote. A minority thus exercised power and control over the majority. Roman tradition held that Servius formed a Comitia Centuriata of commoners to displace the Comitia Curiata as Rome's central legislative body. This required his development of the first Roman census, making Servius the first Roman censor. For the purposes of the census, citizens assembled by tribe in the Campus Martius to register their social rank, household, property and income. This established an individual's tax obligations, his ability to muster arms for military service when required to do so, and his assignment to a particular voting bloc. The institution of the census and the Comitia Centuriata are speculated as Servius or attempt to erode the civil and military power of the Roman aristocracy, and seek the direct support of his newly enfranchised citizenry in civil matters, if necessary, under arms. The Comitia Curiata continued to function through the regal and republican eras but the Servian reform had reduced its powers to those of a largely symbolic upper house, whose noble members were expected to do no more than ratify decisions of the Comitia Centuriata. Classes The census grouped Rome's male citizen population in classes, according to status, wealth and age. Each class was subdivided into groups called centuri, nominally of 100 men but in practice a variable number, further divided as senioris and aeunias. Adult male citizens were obliged, when called upon, to fulfill military service according to their means, which was supposedly assessed in archaic classes. A citizen's wealth and class would therefore have defined their position in the civil hierarchies, and up to a point within the military, but despite its apparent military character and its possible origins is the mustering of the citizenry at arms. The system would have primarily served to determine the voting qualifications and wealth of individual citizens for taxation purposes. 
and the weight of their vote wars were occasional but taxation was a constant necessity, and the Comitia Centuriata met whenever required to do so, in peace or war. Though each century had voting rights, the wealthiest had the most centuries, and voted first. Those beneath them were convened only in the event of deadlock or indecision. The lowest class was unlikely to vote at all. The Roman army's centuria system and its order of battle are thought to be based on the civilian classifications established by the census. The military selection process picked men from civilian centurions and slipped them into military ones. Their function depended on their age, experience, and the equipment they could afford. The wealthiest class of Illuniers were armed as hoplites, heavy infantry with helmet, greaves, breastplate, shields, and spears. Each battle line in the phalanx formation was composed of a single class. Military specialists, such as trumpeters, were chosen from the fifth class. The highest offices were of aristocratic origin until the early Republic when the first plebeian tribunes were elected by the plebeians from their own number. Cornell suggests that this centuriate system made the equites, who consisted mainly, if not exclusively, of patricians but voted after infantry of the first class, subordinate to the relatively low-status infantry. Tribal and boundary expansions The Servian reforms increased the number of tribes and expanded the city, which was protected by a new rampart, moat and wall. The enclosed area was divided into four administrative regionists, the Suburana, Escalana, Kalina and Palatina. Servius himself is said to have taken a new residence on the Escaline. The situation beyond the walls is unclear, but thereafter, membership of a Roman voting tribe would have depended on residence rather than ancestry and inheritance. This would have brought significant numbers of urban and rural plebs into active political life, and a significant number of these would have been allocated to centuries of the first class, and therefore likely to vote. The city of Rome's division in two quarters remained in use until 07 BC, when Augustus divided the city into 14 new regionists. In modern Rome, an ancient portion of surviving wall is attributed to Servius, the remainder supposedly being rebuilt after the sack of Rome in 390-387 BC by the Gauls. Religion Servius is credited with the construction of Diana's temple on the Aventine Hill, to mark the foundation of the so-called Latin League, his servile birth mythos, his populist leanings and his reorganization of the Vici appear to justify the Roman belief that he founded or reformed the Compitalia festivals, or allowed for the first time their attendance and service by non-citizens and slaves. His personal reputation and achievements may have led to his historical association with temples and shrines to Fortuna. Some sources suggest that the two were connected during Servius a lifetime, via some form of sacred marriage. Plutarch explicitly identifies the Porta Fenestella of the royal palace, now lost, as the window from which Tanakiel announced Servius a regency to the people. Later, the goddess Fortuna was said to have later passed through the same window, to become Servius a consort.